Many of us are familiar with a, with a phenomenon of someone that, let's say, decides to donate or to volunteer a thousand hours of their time for communal affairs. And then, but on expense of, let's say, their own family or their own duties or responsibilities that they had before them. So they're doing something great, the volunteering time for communal purposes, but on the same time is coming on expense of something, a responsibility to have, something they are responsible to do, they are supposed to do, they're expected to do, for whatever reason they have that responsibility. So this week's parsha has some insight on such a phenomenon. The backdrop of this week's Torah portion is really the end of last week's Torah portion, where Jacob, where Isaac was getting old, he wants to bless one of his children before he passes away, and he decide, he he wants to bless Esau, the older one, the firstborn, not knowing about the way. Asaph actually acted, which was not really deserving of blessings. But nevertheless, being that he was blind, like the Torah says, and he was unaware, in the simple sense, he was unaware of, what's ha- of, of his actions. He, he, he used to trick his father, try to convince him that he's pious and he's acting properly. So Isaac wanted to bless him. Isaac's wife, Rivka, Rebecca, seeing what's about to happen, told her younger son, Jacob, who she felt was much more worthy of blessing, and told him to go ahead and to get the blessings from their father. Isaac went out to prepare a meal for, uh, Asaf went out to prepare a meal, uh, prepare a meal for Isaac. And as he was out in the field, preparing the mill, trying to hunt the animal, prepare the mill. So Jacob quickly went in, somehow got, I guess, fast food, made a, brought a mill to him, and he got the blessings. As he was walking out, Isaac, uh, Asaph walked in, and he, after a, a short discussion with his father, he realized what has happened that someone has taken his blessings before him. And eventually he he got blessings, but not the ones he wanted, not on the same level as the ones Jacob got. And he was very mad. He was angry. And Rivka, Yaakov and Esau's mother, heard that Esau said, I'll wait for my father to pass away, Isaac. When he passes away, I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to kill my brother, take revenge for the blessings that he stole. Rivka, hearing this, told, told Yaakov, run away. Flee. Go to my brother, go to your uncle, love him. And Veer, stay by him for a while. Get married to one of his children, the... Our forefathers were very uh, particular about trying to marry within relatives, family. So he says, marry one of your, one of his daughters and eventually come back after many years. And then you would, by then Ace of already forget and the story would already be water under the bridge and everything would be calm back as usual. And this week's Torah portion actually begins with the words Vayetze Yaakov. Yaakov went out, traveled, which is the name of the Parsha, Vayetze, traveling, going out. And that is the, that is the first story of the Torah portion. 
speaking about Yaakov's travelings. Eventually, it speaks about how he gets to his uncle, Lavan, Lavan Harami, Lavan the swindler. And he, he basically wanted to, he fell in love with Lavan's younger daughter, Rachel, and he wanted to marry her. Lavan said, sure, no problem. Be my shepherd for a few number of years and marry my daughter. Be my shepherd and I guess as payment, you, you could marry my younger daughter. Okay, so Yaakov they went to the went to get married to the wedding, and sure enough, Asa somehow managed to trick Yaakov. I guess then it was dark. I'm saying the many of the custom, the bride wears a veil by the wedding, and then the house is dark, it's by night. So he didn't see who he was really getting married to. And sure enough, the next morning, he when it's when it's light outside, he and inside he sees, oh, it was Leah. Love and tricked Yaakov and married him off to married off his older daughter, Leah, which was not the which was not the one that Jacob attended to marry, which they were speaking about the whole time. Okay. So Jacob goes to Lavan and says, Why do you trick me? And he says, he right away starts answering himself. Oh, the reason why I tricked you is because it's not it's not customary for a younger in our place, it's not customary for a younger daughter, a younger daughter to be married before a older older daughter, older sister. So therefore I had to marry you to the older one before the younger one. So even though we made up the younger one, but if you want, you can, you can marry the younger one, but we're not, we, we don't, I, I didn't want to, you know, go against the custom and marry off my younger daughter before my older one. Okay. So Jacob said, okay, let me marry the next, the one, the, the, the Rachel, the younger daughter, which is the one that we made up on marrying, that I'm going to marry. So Lava said, no problem. Work for me another seven years and be my shepherd and you can marry the younger daughter. All right. So Yaakov gets married to both of them. The two sisters, Rachel and Leah. He stays by his by Lavan, his father-in-law, for a number of years, working his, tending his flock. And then eventually, many years later, he leaves, he runs away. He, he, tra he travels away. And that is pretty much the four, or four matriarchs of the Jewish nation is Sarah, which is Abraham's wife, Rivka, which is Isaac's wife, and then Rachel, Rachel and Leah, which which are which were Jacob's wives. One of the questions that is discussed a lot in the by the commentaries is later in the Torah, we are known, we are told that it is forbidden to marry two sisters. Technically, one may marry two wives, biblically. Rabbinically, it is forbidden. But biblically, biblically, you're allowed to marry two wives. However, you're not allowed, even someone who marries two wives is not allowed to marry two sisters. So the question that bothers many, many commentar commentaries is why, how was Jacob allowed to marry two wives, two sisters, sorry, two, two wives that were two sisters, while this is something that's going to be, be forbidden later in the Torah very clearly. 
<laughs> to this question, there are many different answers given. We're going to discuss perhaps a few of them today and bring a very unique approach that the Rebbe has regarding this, this, um, this question. But the first thought that comes to mind when hearing the question that how could Jacob marry two wives? Weren't, isn't it forbidden to, mar to marry two sisters? Isn't, isn't it for forbidden to marry two sisters? The first thought that comes to mind is the Torah wasn't given yet. The Torah is given many years later. Jacob was way before the giving of the Torah, the teaching of the law. So what's so wrong if he married two wives? It was not it was not given yet. The Torah wasn't given yet. So we're going to read together a short passage of the Talmud, which is a very famous quote. And it could be we discussed it briefly in other class in other classes. We brought up this idea, which in short it is that the, our forefathers, patriarchs, we they 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 fulfilled the whole Torah before it was given. So the, the first source on the source sheet, number one, which is a passage from the Talmud, Tractate Yuma. Rav said, Abraham, our, our patriarch, fulfilled the entire Torah before it was given. As it is stated, because Abraham hearkened to my voice and kept my charge, my mitzvot, my statutes, my Torah, so that teaches us that he, he, he kept God's commandments. He fulfilled the Torah, even though it wasn't given yet. But, and therefore, because the, Torah, the, the, the verse continues, therefore, Hash, therefore, Hashem is going to give him blessings and give him the land of Israel, what it's talking about over there in those verses. But the, the point is, the point that, we'll, that the Talmud that Rav is learning from this, from this passage is that Abraham listened to the commandments of Hashem, to the Torah. He fulfilled the Torah. And later, the Talmud actually says, goes even a step further and says he fulfilled everything, even the, even the rabbinical enactments that were instituted later. Rav said, and some say Rav Ashi said, it's not clear who it is, who this, the following statement is attributed to, either Rav or Rav Ashi. Abraham, our patriarch, fulfilled the entire Torah, even the mitzvah of joining of cooked foods, a rabbinic audience instituted later, which is a particular commandment regarding when, when, there is a holiday and Shabbat one after another. When Shabbat is when a holiday when is followed by Shabbat, so a holiday is Thursday, Friday. So then there is a certain commandment, a rabbinic commandment that we set aside food in order that we should be able to cook for on the holiday for Shabbat, which is a separate discussion. But the point is, is that he, the, the, even, a, a, even a rabbinic audience that is clear, that was instituted later, that is not biblically, biblically recommended, required, he still kept it. As it is stated, my Torahs, that, that, that in the above mentioned verse, that Abraham kept the Torahs, since the term is in plural, it indicates that Abraham kept two Torahs, one the written Torah and one the oral Torah. In the course of fulfilling the oral Torah, he fulfilled all the details and parameters included therein. So here we have a very clear source in the Talmud that states, based on a verse, based on expanding on a verse, that Abraham kept the entire Torah. Abraham, and it is assumed the, true, the, the same is true regarding his children. After all, the verse that says that he kept the Torah, that indicates that he kept the Torah, also says that he taught it to his children after him. That is part of the verse. I didn't quote that part, but that is, that is part of the verse. So, uh, so it is typically assumed that what, he, that what he learned and what he did, 
he also passed on to his descendants, at least to his direct lineage, meaning the Isaac and Isaac to Jacob and Jacob to the tribes. And there are more sources that indicate and really show that Jacob and Abraham both both all the all of our forefathers kept the Torah. So if this is true, so so that would rule out the possibility that the Talmud is only speaking about Abraham and not about Jacob. If it's true regarding Abraham, it's true regarding Jacob. Okay, so if this is true, our answer that we wanted to say that maybe, yeah, the Torah later is going to forbid marrying two sisters, but the Torah wasn't given yet. That answer falls apart because they kept the Torah, the commandments of the Torah that were given later. So we're on search to understand how was Abraham able, how was Jacob able to marry two children, two sisters, something that was, that would be forbidden many years later. Is this clear? Any Rabbi, questions, comments? Yeah. Yes. How was this documented? Uh, I, how, they didn't have a, um, it wasn't written in, uh, on any kind of parchment, uh, this, the, these two Torah scrolls that we talk about, how was this kept documented? I mean, we, how do uh, we know those, about it or how did they fulfill it? How, how, did, how did we know about it? How did we know about so it? So the way we know about it is based on the verse that the Talmud quotes, which indicates that they kept it. But how, do, um, how from generation to generation up until the Torah... Did they keep document? Did, were oh, they able so to they, document? So it was given over as a tradition. They had, they had some. They they knew the laws, I guess, by a divine revelation, and they and they passed it over. It actually says much later that when Jacob, a later episode that's going to be in one of the upcoming partial Torah portions, that when Joseph left left Jacob. And he wandered away and he got he sort of got lost for many, many years, 22 years. He, they the last thing they, they did together was actually studying a certain portion of the Torah. So yes, so they had the portions that were passed over, probably orally, and uh, and they kept it. The ones the commandments that they're able to keep they kept. I see. Okay. Thank you. Answers. All right. So we're going to start with a with one approach that the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, offers, and we're going to learn it together inside. The second source. All right, Ramban, the twelfth, the thirteenth century scholar. Number two. So Nachmanides is discussing the, this, this exact concept of the, our forefathers keeping the Torah, absorbing the Torah. And after he presents the general the proofs and the idea that they preserve the Torah, he says, the question presents itself. If it be the case that the laws of the Torah are absorbed, by our ancestors before the Torah was given on Sinai. How did Jacob, he mentions a few problematic things that Jacob did, but the main problem that we're discussing in our class, how did he marry two sisters in their lifetime? So he says the following, now it appears to me from a study of the opinions of our, our, our rabbis that Abraham, our father, learned the entire Torah by Rach HaKodesh, divinely inspired, divine inspiration, and occupied himself with its study and the reason for its commandments and its secrets. And he observed it in its entirely as one who is not commanded, but nevertheless observes it. Sometimes there's someone that's exempt from a certain requirement, but if he wants, he could voluntarily keep that requirement. So also Abraham, 
even though he was not required to keep the Torah, he nevertheless just kept it. Furthermore, his observance of the Torah applied only in the land of Israel, whereas, whereas Jacob married two sisters only when outside the land. This is the answer. The Nachmanides argues that that the, our forefathers only kept the Torah in the land of Israel. And he goes on to explain that even though true the Torah is not limited to the land of Israel, it is an obligation for every individual, no matter where he or she may be. Nevertheless, there's still a special connection between Hashem and the Torah and Israel. And therefore, the, the, our forefathers that kept it voluntarily, they, they kept it in Israel, only when they're in Israel, not when they were outside of Israel. That is his, that is his opinion. Now, while definitely a opinion and an approach, there are other commentaries that clearly disagree with this idea and this clear indication that even outside of the land of Israel, our forefathers kept the Torah. Actually, a commentary that we quote many times, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, he makes a comment in the beginning of a later Torah portion when, eight, when Jacob leaves his father-in-law and is finally, after many, many years, traveling back to Israel. And he, there he actually meets his brother Esau on the way, which is a story for itself. But just he told him, he sent him actually a messenger trying to appease him because he heard that he's coming with a whole army of people. So he sent, he sent with him a messenger and told him, listen, I was by my, I was by Lavan, our uncle Lavan. And he throws in that I live by Lavan. And Rashi makes this comment that he also said, and I kept the Torah. I kept all the mitzvot. The point of this comment is that he wants to tell him that even though I kept all the mitzvot, the, the blessings didn't, um, I didn't really see any blessings. I pretty had a hard time with, with, my, with, my, with our uncle Lavan. So don't be jealous of me about the blessings. But the point that we see there is that he actually kept the mitzvot. He kept the commandments even outside of Israel. So true, the Nachmanides which is a little later than Rashi, maybe he has a different opinion, but at least if we're studying Rashi or with that group of scholars, we have to search for another, for another explanation on where, why did Jacob not, how is Jacob able to marry two sisters? A second approach, which is, which other commentaries say, that Jacob had an expli a, a clear message from Hashem, almost like a prophecy, telling him to marry both sisters. He was told to. Now, obviously, if Hashem gives you a commandment to do something, and then he somehow communicates to you to do otherwise, you listen to an overriding the general commandment, you'll listen to the more particular commandment, the one that he tells you to do now as an, as an exception to the rule. So why, so this might be another possible answer why Jacob was able to marry two sisters because he was told to. While, okay, he was told to. He was clearly told to. And that clear, that clear message overrides a law that was given many years later. Okay. While an answer, definitely an answer. Yes. 
Can you Thanks. tell me where you find it, that, that he was given a message to change? So that was actually our objection that we're about to bring up to this okay. explanation. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you, you, you nailed it. That's it. That the idea is, is that you, that, um, that even though this is definitely a possible answer, but the problem is, is that we don't really find too much indication in the text for this explanation, for this, that he got a special message and was told to marry two sisters. On the contrary, it seems when you read the Torah that it wasn't done based on what Hashem told him. It was done based on his own decisions from the conversations that he had with, La with Lavan and the conversations he had with, with his wives, Baruch and Leah, it doesn't really seem that there was any clear message to tell him to marry two wives. So, true, some commentaries give this explanation, but it still falls short, at least on a very simple level, a simple reading of the text, how is he able to marry two, two sisters? So let's just summarize where we're holding. We started with a with a with the story of the Jacob marrying two sisters, how he got there. He was tricked into one. He was tricked to marry the older one, and therefore he he decided that he's going to marry the second one. He promised the second to marry the younger one. That's one that he attended originally, and he. And he, therefore, he married her. The question that we're grappling with, that we're trying to find a solution to, is how was he able to marry these two siblings? Isn't it forbidden by the Torah to marry two siblings? So the first answer that we try to give is, okay, the Torah wasn't given yet. Which a very simple and straightforward answer it is, but it falls short by the fact that the Talmud and many, many commenta commentaries bring, bring this concept, and it's clearly indicated in the verse that our forefathers did keep the Torah. Okay, so if they kept the Torah before it's given, meaning before it's given as, as an official obligation, they voluntarily kept the Torah, then the, they obviously kept all the commandments, including this one not to marry two sisters. So how did he marry two sisters? So we brought up two other explanations. One is Nachmanides' explanation that the, our forefathers only kept the Torah while they were in Israel, not when they left Israel. And the problem is, is that this is debated if they kept it outside of Israel. And there is a lot of indication that they did keep it outside of Israel. So there we went on to a second answer that maybe they are told clearly to do so. Which also falls short because it is not, it's not clear anywhere that they were told to do the Torah. So here we come back to square one. Why did Jacob, how was he allowed to marry two sisters if he, kept up, if he took upon himself to keep the whole Torah before it was given? Any thoughts? Anyone has any thoughts? Yeah. I would think maybe because he was not in Israel. He married them in, in Haran. Well, who said he didn't keep the Torah to, outside of Israel? You have to follow the local laws too. So if Lavan tells him the local law is that you marry the old one first, and then if you, if you want the young one, you have to marry your second. So maybe he should just stick with the older one. If that's the life he wants. <laughs> well, I imagine that the life he wants is to do what they to do on the mitzvot. And if it's forbidden to marry two wives, I don't know, maybe they should divorce and then marry the second one, which won't really be an, which won't really be, really be an answer because one may not marry two sisters as long as they're both alive, even if he divorces one. Oh. So divorce won't even be a, be a 
uh, uh, a proper answer. Is One that from the Torah or is that yeah. from, the, from the No, Talmud? the Torah. The Torah says. And where is that at? Where does it say you can't marry two sisters? Yeah. I'll tell you in a second. Because <laughs> I never saw it. You never saw it? No. I'll tell you. So I didn't mark down the source. It okay. is... Mm. Yeah. Probably we're probably not remote in the Torah portion. Probably in the Torah portion of Achare Mot, which is I'll tell you. Yeah. Where it speaks about the forbidden relations. But it is you want an exact source. Yen Kippur Laning. Yeah. Yeah, it's in Achare. So it'll be in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18. 18, 18. Vayikra Yitches Yitches. Found it? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions? Rabbi. Yeah. I have a question. This backtracks to uh, Yitzhak and Yaakov. Um, how can we say for certain that Yitzhak gave the, the brachas to, to Yaakov instead of to Esau? Because the Bechor was always traditionally in most of the, in those days would mostly be the ones who would get the traditionally they're the ones who are more favored than the younger than the younger because even in today's society you know the, the Bechor is always there's more emphasis placed on the Bechor secondly um, Jacob uh, you know he he was he was the youngest, and in in heart, it seemed to me that Yitzhak was intending to give the brachas to to Esau because he was the bechor and he was the one who was providing his gash mute, and all his needs were being satisfied by him. And um, so I he approached him with those with the, the gloves of a bear, okay, right. and Esau thought and and, and um, uh, um, Yitzchak thought that that was his son uh, Esau. So, right. so, how do we know for certain that? How do we know for certain that he knew that that, that he was giving the brachas to uh, uh, you know the berachot to right. um, to um, uh, Yaakov? So, I think what your question is is, if I'm understanding you correctly, that if Jacob tricked his father to give him the blessings. Maybe he never intended to give it to him altogether. He intended for someone else. Maybe he, he thought tricked. You know, he, maybe he thought his own son was gonna. It was Geneva. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I don't want to. Maybe put he it in those terms, but right. So, in other words, he was tricked. So, Jake Isaac had in mind the other son, and he was, he thought that's who's standing in front of him. So maybe that's who the tension was, and that's who got the blessings. That's your question, correct? Yes. So one of the answers to this question is, if you go back to the end of last week's Torah portion, where this is discussed, you will see that after Ace of came and Scream, actually before, Ace of came and Ace of says, I'm here, Ace of your firstborn. And Yitzhak trembles and says, Wait, who's the person that came before? And they blessed him. But then he says, you go to chapter 27, verse 33. He says, I blessed him. But then he says, let him be blessed. So you see, even after Isaac realized the mistake, what happened, he didn't retract it. And more than that, after Esau starts screaming, he again, he says, too late. I blessed him. He's the one that's blessed. And then 
Asa said, oh, do you still have a blessing? And he said, okay, fine, I'll give you a blessing. But you see that even if Isaac would have retracted it, then you're correct. Your question would be a very serious question. But we see clearly not only he didn't retract it, but he clearly reinforced it after finding out the truth. Couldn't he have given him a, 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 a bracha that was even more... Uh, had more extensive than what he gave to Jacob in order to override. So, so from the, the, the um, so from the verses, it won't seem that way because it, it it says also clearly that I made him a ruler over you, and he says I already gave him like the best, but okay, I'll give you something also. If you look, if you look at the verses there in, in chapter twenty seven. And you compare the blessings and you look at and you see the conversation, it doesn't seem like he really gave the better, so to speak, blessing to the other, to the older brother after he didn't really retract that. Okay. I see. Okay. Right. Thank you. Sure. I had heard Bart a long time ago. What yeah. You learn, what you learn from all of this is not so much what the bracha was as what was done with it. Because if you look at the differences between the bracha to Esav and Yaakov, there wasn't that much of a difference. They both have, you know, you look at the two and you're wondering right. what it's what you, the person who received the bracha did with it. That's right. the important. There's a lot. There's a lot of discussion in what exactly is the difference between the two brachas. You know, which if there if if there's a way to categorize them differently. Exactly. There was no Sirach. In a, when it came to Asim's bracha, the only thing you don't have by that you have by Yaakov and you don't have by Aso is Sirach. Right. Why? Because you say a yid, you're dealing with Sirach, you know how to do Kedusha with it. You make Kiddush, you make Havdali, you can use right. it appropriately. You don't give that to Aso. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, I think there is another difference that Yaakov was put to rule over Esau. Right. But only... And, and, and I want to add, but this is on pride. It's on, you know... Condition. It's on the condition that he will keep his, his religion, if, if, fulfill the mitzvot. If not, then Esau will take over. Right. I don't think so. I think we would learn different lessons from Yishmael and from Esau. Yishmael was a different mother, a different I just said, I just said that and how you deal the with lesson. that. With Esau, he's your brother no matter what. Esau is still our brother. He's not us, and he's whatever, but he's from the same mother and the same father. He's your twin. How can you say not? You smile. It's a different story. But, but that was the blessing that Jacob will rule over him as long as he keeps his his uh, nigh, his condition. Otherwise, Asa will take over and rule. But that's if, if we keep our condition. It has nothing to do with what Aesop does. It has, no, it has to nothing to do with Aesop, do. just with Jacob. That's right. Okay. But that's the condition. All right. We could agree to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's move on to our final answer to this question. So, again, we're trying to discuss why the... We're trying to this. We're trying. We're trying to. We're looking. We're searching for an answer. How is a Jacob able to marry two sisters? The Rebbe, after discussing the, the the explanations that we gave earlier, and raises the objections to some of them, he offers a very unique, novel but somewhat simple approach. He says like this. We know there were commandments given to Adam and to Noah 
known as the seven Noahide laws, which are commandments, which are oblig which are obligations, not voluntarily, Vol not things that you could do voluntarily, but rather ob obligatory obligations. Now, the our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, most definitely kept those seven Noahide laws. Let's say. And on the other hand, in addition to keeping the Noahide laws, they also kept the Sinai laws, the Torah, the 613 commandments, whatever they're able to do in those times. So in addition to keeping the basic laws, the Noahide laws, the seven Noahide laws, they also kept the, the, the Sinai commandments, the, the Torah, the whole Torah. What would happen if there was a clash between the Noahide laws and the commandments given by Sinai, then what should one do? Should you follow the Noahide laws? Should you follow the laws given by Sinai? So I think- an example. You have an example? Yeah. I think conceive uh, of where one is a all right i'll give you i'll give an example there's an example that one may not may not kill somebody or kill themselves and it also says you should not spill your own blood which could also mean not to court not to in a way of extension not to cause yourself harm okay so let's say the commandment of brit mila circumcision which is in a certain sense causing yourself harm which would be in contradiction to the noahide laws of not causing harm to yourself so which one should you do now if hashem clearly comes and tells you do the commandment then of course even if it's in contradiction to another commandment you do it and obviously this is an except this is an exception to the rule but let's say he didn't tell you clearly to do it. You are accepting upon yourself something extra to do. You want to be extra pious, extra stringent. You want to do out of great devotion. You want to do extra commandments that you're not obligated to do. But those things that you accepted upon yourself, which, you, which you're not obligated to do, if that is in contradiction to something you're obligated to do, obviously what you're obligated to do overrides what you are, the, the extra stringency that you accepted upon yourself. For example, in that case, there is a, there's a discussion. If Abraham kept the whole Torah, why did it take him 99 years to, do, to, to circumcise himself? Shouldn't he have circumcised himself way earlier, as soon as he heard about the Torah and he started to keep it? But this is one possible answer. That since circ circumcision, if it's not a clear directive, then it is in contradiction to the Noahide laws. Obviously, the Noahide laws, which is something you're obligated to do, override something that you're doing extra, right? Someone who takes a test and doesn't know any of the answers but only does the extra credit usually fails the test, right? Because that, if that's extra credit, but you first have to do the first, the things that you're supposed to know. The, the, the mandatory no ways If you don't know, C is the answer. That was the rule. What? You know? If you don't know, then the answer is C. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so the... Yeah, Ben, I'll get... I, I just, have, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say about sure. the bliss... There is also the, the issue of the date, you know, when you're supposed to do it. One is right. from Sinai and one is from Orion. Right, you're saying eight days. Right, eight days right. or 13 years. Right, but Abraham was way older than 13 years. Right. Right. So, but that maybe would be a thing that when should you do it, if there's a contradiction between... So, based on this idea, which is a, a very logical idea that when someone accepts upon themselves extra stringencies, 
they can't do that on account or on expense of something they're obligated to do. So the Rebbe goes a step further. And he says, in addition to the seven Noahide laws, which are obligations, there are also certain universal universal, um, uh, let's say laws or ethical ethical Standard. behaviors. Yeah, thank you. Ethical behaviors that people universally accepted upon themselves. And these ethical behaviors that are universally accepted, even if they're not clearly part of the Noahide laws, but they have the same strength and, the, and, they're, and there's an obligation to keep them just as much as the Noahide laws. All right, so it has that strength and that sincerity to keep the universal accepted um, ethical behavior as if it's a commandment. Now, one of these, one of the ethical and moral behaviors that was universally accepted, and I think is universally accepted pretty much to this day, is not to lie and cheat, to honor your word, right? That's a pretty much, that's a universal accepted moral. More than that, we see in this story, after Jacob tricked her, his, his, his nephew, he didn't, and Jacob said, why do you trick me? Why do you give me the older sister? Lavan didn't say, haha, tricked you, too bad. He looked for excuses. Oh, there's, there's this reason because that's not the proper way to do it. That's not the custom of the place. Because he felt that there's something that he needs to cover up. He did something wrong, something that wasn't accepted. If it was accepted to lie and to not honor your word, then he won't even feel a need to answer his actions. From the fact that he searched to answer his actions, that means that it was, it was accepted not to... It was accepted to honor your word and not to trick people. Now, Jacob promised Rachel that he's going to marry her. They made up that they're going to get married. Last second, he was tricked. And he ended up with Leah. So the next morning, he really has in front of himself this dilemma. On the one hand, I promise Rachel I'm going to marry her. And I want to keep my word. I want to honor my word. If I won't marry her, she, I'm not keeping my word. And she probably won't agree not to not marry Jacob. She wanted to marry Jacob. On the other hand, so that's keeping his word, honoring his word, being honest. On the other hand, he has the commandment that's going to be given many years later, which he accepted upon himself to do, not to marry two sisters. So he has this clash, something that is universally accepted, which is almost like an obligation, because this is something that's, something that's universally accepted, or like we said earlier, has almost a strength of an obligation. And on the other hand, he has here a a commandment that's going to be given many years later. So what should override what? What should we do in a case where they both clash? The answer is, which we just gave, is that obviously you have to do what you're obligated to doing. Something extra, when you want to go the extra mile and be extra pious and be more stringent and accept upon yourself extra good, good behaviors, that can come on account of something you're obligated to do. So therefore, Jacob had to let go of the commandment, not keep the commandment, but rather keep the, the, his word, which was a universal accepted behavior. And therefore, he married two sisters. So that's the explanation that the Rebbe gives for this, for this question after discussing many of the other explanations. 
and raising problems, objections to some of them, and which they, which is which is basically saying that we have here that it's it, it, the 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 foundation the the main point here is categorizing in what way did the when when we say that they kept the mitzvot the commandments they weren't it, what what was their status their status wasn't in a way of obligation that's why it's actually a special merit that God said I'm giving Abraham these blessings because because he's accepting these commandments. Meaning there's something special that he did. Something that he wasn't obligated in doing. And therefore, since it is something extra that they accepted upon themselves, that can't come on account to something they're obligated to do. So that's why when there was a clash, which true, doesn't happen so often, but every once in a while, there could be. And this is an example of a clash. Honoring his word. Verse keeping a mitzvah, a commandment that's going to be given many years later. So then the commandment honoring your word overrides the, the commandment, the on, honoring your word overrides the commandment of the commandment, which is only an extra pious thing to do. Yeah. Question? Rabbi? Rabbi, yeah. yes, I have a question. Um, I, I'm not sure maybe this is a and rush, but I understood that there were certain signs that were given, um, which uh, Rachel had, which she uh, uh, was uh, going to give to Yaakov, and instead, um, because Leah was her older sister, for whatever reason, she gave those signs to Leah so that um, Leah would actually be mistaken for her. Um, this is what I, this is a story that I have heard. Right. And that, and that Yaakov, so how, I mean, didn't Leah deceive him in a sense, although it, I would have understood that it was universally accepted that the older daughter marries before the younger, um, but uh, I do understand that, uh, I mean, there was an element of deceit here to yeah, by Yaakov. Rachel. By Rachel. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. And, and she is praised for it. It's considered sacrifice. Well, I'm not sure. She's I'm not sure that he, that they had a choice in the matter. Meaning, Rachel, even though Rachel had those signs, but if Rachel wouldn't, it's not like, you see, from the fact that Lavan tricked Jacob, and there was no, you know, it wasn't a clear, Rachel didn't say anything to Jacob before, Leah didn't say anything, so I'm not sure if they really had a choice in the matter, meaning that if Leah would have said, I'm not interested, she was able to do that. I don't know, we're getting into crazy hypotheticals. But let me, I, I had one great word that I picked up recently that transformed this whole Misa with Rachel, Leia, Laban. Yeah. Why is this in the Torah? If it's Torah, then it's for all generations and it's for everybody. To hear about some guy's problem with two sisters and older and younger and trick. Somebody said, no, 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 this is Tyra, which means it applies to every human being. Which means it applies to every person the morning after they wake up after the wedding and they turn to the person next to them and say, who is she? This is not who I married. And this is not what I thought. And I didn't know you leave the toothpaste unplugged. And I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And you learn to work it out together. But the story of Yaakov waking up in the morning and feeling deceived because he has Leia instead of Rachel is one that we all have to learn from. Who did he have all the Shvatim with? He had six of the Shvatim with Leia. Supposedly the Snua, the one who was hated, and the way he had to deal with them, and the way even that their children had to deal with each other. 
I think if you integrate the elements into yourself and think about it that way in terms of perspective, it can be very yeah. whatever. My yeah. job is seven Lebanon. Sorry. Yeah. Just to uh, conclude, yeah, thank you very much. That's a nice start. Just to conclude, this explanation in what in the story has a very, very powerful lesson. It tells us that sometimes we accept upon ourselves extra stringencies, extra, you know, extra good behavior to do something extra. But that can't come on expense on, of what we're obligated to of what we're obligated to do. We have an obligation. The obligation comes first. And this could be, and this is true, and it's a lesson in, there, in many areas. Sometimes we have an obligation to our family and accepting upon ourselves, even let's say the example that we gave in the beginning of the class, to do volunteer, to volunteer for communal work, even if that's very important and it is very important but that can't come on expense of our family or of our spouse or whatever it might be and the same is true in our let's say devotion and commitment and service to Hashem that there's things that we are obligated to do and when we voluntarily accept upon ourselves to go the extra mile but that can't come on expense of someone else's comfort sometimes people want to behave a certain way but it's it's on the expense of other people's comfort so something that we're obligated to do okay you have to do but something is not an obligation so then we have to make sure that we're fulfilling in our, our our obligations so that's a very powerful lesson that we learned from the story that jacob even though he wanted to keep all the mitzvot which is a very special thing to keep the Torah even before it's given, before it's mandatory. But nevertheless, he, he, he waived that because he wanted to keep his word and be honest with someone else. So obviously now, by us, all the after the Torah is given, everything is obligation. But then there's other things that are not obligatory, not, that we don't have an obligation for. And those are the things that come second after we first fulfill our obligation. Right. Anyways, that's uh, any questions? Any more questions or comments? All right. So everyone have 